My name is Margot Landman, and I am Deputy Vice President for Programs at the National Committee on US-China Relations. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker and moderator for today's interview on the recent visit to China of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Very briefly, Philip Alston is John Norton Pomeroy Professor of Law at the New York University Law School. He has extensive experience at the United Nations, having served as Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights from 2014 to 2020. He undertook a country visit to China in 2017 and was also Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Executions, Chairperson of the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, Independent Expert on Reform of the UN Human Rights Treaty Body System, and Special Advisor to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights on the Millennium Development Goals. Moderating for us today is Tom Kellogg, Executive Director of the Georgetown Center for Asian Law, where he oversees programs related to law and governance in Asia. He is a scholar of legal reform in China, Chinese constitutionalism, and China's approach to international law. He is also a fellow in the National Committee's Public Intellectuals Program and a member of our Track 2 Dialogue on Human Rights and rule of law. Tom, without further ado, I turn the floor over to you. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Margot. Uh, Professor Olson, it's good to be with you again. Uh, you may remember uh, that we met in the run up uh, to your visit to China uh, back in 2016 uh, in your capacity as the special rapporteur on uh, extreme poverty and human rights. And I thought we might start there as hopefully helpful background. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, uh, UN human rights engagement uh, with China over the years? Of course, it's been quite fraught uh, since 1989, and in some ways, uh, the uh, controversial visit uh, by the High Commissioner is uh, somewhat of a, a continuation or even escalation of that, that level of uh, uh, fraughtness, if I can put it that way. Yeah, it's been an interesting ride. I was actually invited by the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences back in 1988 mm -hmm. <laughs> um, to advise on ratification of the two covenants. And it seemed at that time that there was a really genuine interest in moving ahead with ratification. Uh, but of course, Tiananmen um, put an end to all of that. Uh, I think the, I mean, we do need to uh, also acknowledge the politics of the relationship between China and the UN. Um, after Tiananmen, uh, Western governments, uh, and particularly the United States, um, tried to make use of the UN human rights machinery to not just chastise China, but to uh, come up with serious uh, critical res country based resolutions. Uh, I have no doubt that uh, such resolutions would have been fully justified, but uh, the reality nonetheless was that there had never been such a resolution against any of the large Western countries. And China felt that it was being singled out and that a, uh, a basically an ideological campaign was being waged through the UN. Um, now that really triggered um, <clears throat> the emergence of China, which up until then had been essentially, I'd say almost invisible uh, at the UN. Uh, it played a very minor role. It reacted very rarely, uh, but it then really committed to trying to limit the scope and effectiveness of UN procedures and started a long running campaign, which is still going to try to reshape the way in which these issues are thought of and dealt with. 
Um, one former High Commissioner was invited, 2005, Louise Arbor was able to visit. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the expectations were much lower. Uh, the level of publicity around specific violations was much lower. Uh, and it was accepted that that was a largely diplomatic exercise at that time, which could have had beneficial effects. Since that time, China has uh, been very reluctant to uh, engage. And that includes, of course, the special procedures system, in other words, the special rapporteurs. Uh, there were a couple of visits before I went in 2016. Um, they were not uh, especially successful. There was, in fact, a visit just the year before mine by the uh, independent expert on, uh, on foreign debt. And that uh was a very unhappy experience in the sense that the special or the independent expert actually abandoned the mission a day or two early as a result of um the sort of surveillance uh, to which he and his team were subjected i remember but that unfortunately uh, not a lot of fuss was made about that. And I think that encouraged the government to think that it could get away with that, that those sorts of terms of engagement uh, and there wouldn't be any pushback. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So when it came to my visit in late 2016, October, um, I was subject to the same sort of pressures that uh, the previous visitor had been uh, had experienced. Uh, I was followed wherever I went. Um, the people following were fairly uh, visible, uh, which uh, some senior diplomats said to me was a very good sign because it's when you can't see them that you should really be worried. But if they're dead obvious, then they're just sending a message. Um, but they did uh, arrest people who were trying to meet with me. Uh, they did prevent even academics working on banal subjects like uh, agriculture and so on from talking with me. Uh, and they did set up some Potemkin village visits for me. Um, I have no doubt that um, we were systematically bugged um, uh, and that the government was uh, following up on every conversation that we had. Uh, those are the rules of the game uh, in China. Yeah. Uh, if you have a government that is surveilling all of its citizens, um, uh, uh, to the greatest degree possible, uh, you don't expect that it's suddenly going to make an exception for someone who they see as a very uh, problematic and not very welcome visitor. Yeah, no, I, I hear that. I would still uh, call your visit uh, a success in part because you were able to make a very strong statement about uh, both the positive uh, and the negative aspects of uh, what you saw and what you heard during your visit, uh, during your press conference uh, in uh, Beijing and the final report that you released coming out of that visit um, was, uh, I think, appropriately critical where it needed to be, but also giving credit where uh, credit is due. And there is a lot of uh, positive to be said in terms of China's efforts to uh, eliminate uh, extreme uh, poverty. Now, turning to uh, Madame uh, Bachelet's uh, visit, uh, obviously um, uh, a lot of uh, activists uh, and a lot of uh, governments have been uh, uh, somewhat critical uh, of uh, 
even her initial decision uh, to go, um, and then uh, critical of how the visit uh, played out on the ground while she was there. What's your take on uh, the visit? Should she have gone given the, the restrictions uh, that were, were put in place? Uh, and how do you think the visit played out? Well, <laughs> there's a lot in those couple of questions, in fact. Yes, yes. Um, First of all, one does have to have some understanding of the role of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some contexts and occasions on which she is a, an unmitigated human rights advocate and where her voice is not going to sound very different from that of a, uh, a big time human rights uh, proponent. Mm -hmm. Uh, but she's also a diplomat uh, and a negotiator. And there's been a, a long history where various high commissioners have tried different approaches. It's, uh, it's much too long a history for us to go into here, but um, in a nutshell, uh, there, the first High Commissioner really was not prepared to say anything much publicly, uh, followed by Mary Robinson, who spoke out uh, strongly, um, followed by the appointment of Sergio Vieira de Mello, which was actually intended to tamp down the whole exercise because he was not a human rights advocate, he was a humanitarian and it was expected that he would lower the profile and the temperature. Uh, but uh, he was, after his uh, terrible killing in uh, Iraq, he was followed by a couple of more activist um, and committed high commissioners. Uh, and so when Bachelet came in, there was a lot of pressure on her to don't be like your predecessor, don't speak out like Zayd al Hussein had done, uh, be more diplomatic. And I think she has adopted something of a middle path, uh, particularly where she thinks it's not too problematic to be highly critical, she will be, but where the stakes are higher, she has been more uh, careful. Uh, going to China, then the question for her is what approach should she have taken? Um, the first question I think you asked was whether she should have gone. Uh, here, I don't have any doubt. Um, one can always hold out for the perfect circumstances. Uh, and I think anyone could have said uh, as High Commissioner, well, I'm not going unless you do the following 20 things. And the response would have been fine. Uh, see you later, um, yeah. don't bother. Uh, and so instead of doing that, uh, she decided that she would engage diplomatically. Uh, obviously this was a very long negotiated process one shouldn't underestimate the extent to which the Chinese play hardball. Uh, she would have uh, been constantly under a threat that the visit would be cancelled uh, if um, certain things uh, were said or done in advance of it. Um, and clearly she was walking on eggshells. Um, I think that it was understandable for the various human rights groups to try to raise expectations, but they were clearly unrealistic and inflated. Now their job of course, is to put pressure on a high commissioner and to uh, also enable her to say to the Chinese government, look at those uh, human rights um, maniacs, they're demanding uh, <laughs> that I do and say something. So I hope you'll understand if I do have to say some uh, things that you won't like, it, but it's because I'm being pushed. Um, 
but nonetheless, the expectations were quite unrealistic. Um, the basis for the visit, uh, I think, is difficult for non-diplomats to understand. Uh, she herself said, look, I'm not a fact finder. I'm not going to do any original investigation. And this is this was called by the Chinese a private visit. Now, those uh, characterizations are incorrect. There's no such thing as a private visit for uh, a high commissioner. Yeah. Um, it's true that she doesn't do fact finding in the sense of speaking with people who haven't been spoken to before, etc. But she is fact finding to the extent that whatever she says at the end uh, has an important impact on shaping the discourse. Uh, and she is presenting facts as either having great significance or having little significance. So um, the, I understand the reasons why she would have made the statements that she did that, you know, don't, have, don't expect much. It's just a, a diplomatic discussion. Uh, but it would be very unfortunate if she really believed that, those lines. So then I think we come to the actual statement itself. And if I can go back to my own visit, and I appreciate your uh, positive assessment, uh, I was aware uh, all along that I was balancing competing expectations. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese had made it clear that if my visit was uh, incendiary, that would have huge implications for the system as a whole. Mm -hmm. And those threats were not very subtle. Um, there's something to it. In other words, if I had simply gone and behaved like an activist, I think it would have set the, 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 the whole equation back in time uh, because it would have sent the message that you can't have a civilized discussion with UN human rights monitors, that they arrive with their own agenda and there's no point in trying to cooperate. So I was aware from the outset that obviously there were limits to what I could do and what I could say. Um, at the same time, one has to keep in mind that one is representing not just the UN, but the principles of human rights and those who have been victimized and who are suffering from uh, the uh, bad behavior of the government. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a very important role for truth telling and for moving forward the debate in terms of how people really understand things and what messages are conveyed. So, I mean, I won't speak any more about my visit other than to say that what I did then was to balance very complementary uh, observations about poverty elimination, which as you said, were fully justified mm -hmm. with um, exposure of the harassment to which I'd been subjected but more importantly, um, a detailed critique of the absence of accountability mechanisms in China and um, a fairly uh, strong statement that China is not actually um, implementing economic and social rights as it so often claims to be doing, that it doesn't treat these issues of health care and so on as human rights. They are simply development objectives. Uh, and I think that's a very important point that is often overlooked. But in any event, my statement was balanced. 
at the end of the day, the Chinese government had to make a decision. Should they attack me and say they really didn't like the statement and that I was a stooge or whatever? Or should they instead, and this is what they decided to do, ignore the critical parts and play up the positive parts and try to make hay out of that? Now, I think that's the, exactly the same equation that Bachelet should have thought she was uh, confronting. Uh, it's clear that she had to say some positive things to express appreciation for the dialogue, which was an important uh, step. Uh, but she also has a range of constituents um, particularly, of course, in China, the people who are, really are uh, the uh, targets of the various violations that have been uh, very uh, convincingly uh, documented. Um, and I think it was essential for her to um, not just send discrete messages, but to make statements that were pretty clear and uh, uncompromising might be too strong a word because there's always some compromise in diplomatic negotiations unless you've simply given up and you're grandstanding for the folks back home. Um, but you, that doesn't mean you compromise on the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. And I think that Bachelet must have gone into this exercise thinking that there would be more to come down the road and it wouldn't matter if the outcome of this particular visit was bland and even banal because she had arranged continuing dialogues and promises of future invitations and so on. Uh, I think that was clearly a mistake. Yeah. Uh, the virtue of her visit was that it focused a huge spotlight on these challenges, uh, gave the floor to the Uyghur representatives, um, brought in the leading international NGOs to make powerful critical statements. And when you've got that on one side, you can't then respond by saying, yes, yes, I, I hear you. And yes, these are certainly important issues. And I'm sure we'll deal with them more in the future. Thank you. That's the sort of thing that can be done in a low, prof low profile setting, but not when the full glare of the international community is upon you. And so I think that uh, the High Commissioner failed to work out the full extent of the critical comments that were both needed and which she could defend uh, to the Chinese government when they responded um, very, uh, in a very angry way. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, know, you should simply have been able to say, listen, you know, I've got my own credibility to uphold. Uh, the reports are out there. If you had provided information that contradicted those reports, if you had provided any access um, to the relevant areas, if there was any credible information on the other side, I may have hesitated. But since there is not, I have no choice but to say that these, and then she can soften it. These are my concerns. Yes. She doesn't have to say, this is what is happening. Mm -hmm. But she opted not to do that. And I think that the deep disappointment that followed was uh, understandable and, and justified. I, I'm inclined to agree, and just a quick editorial comment, I think, especially her decision to 
to a significant extent, sort of adopt uh, the counterterrorism framing uh, of the Chinese government on and some of her comments on, on Xinjiang, I think was, uh, was a mistake. Um, and uh, as you say, no one is expecting that in a conference in Beijing, she can speak the same way that uh, an advocate here in Washington uh, or up in New York would. Um, but uh, I think you're right to say that a better balance could have been, could have been struck. And just following up on that and, and, and looking forward, uh, is there, uh, of course, we are now aware that uh, she has announced uh, that she's not going to seek a, a second term uh, as high uh, commissioner, and, and though she has said that there is no connection uh, between that decision and her uh, visit to, to China, of course, there, there, there's a temporal connection, if nothing, uh, if nothing else. Uh, and so my question is, uh, is it now, are the politics around um, uh, Human rights situation in uh, inside China um, just too hot um, in ways that it may be impossible uh, for future either uh, high commissioners or, or others in the UN system uh, to be able to strike that balance. And in other words, where do you think the uh, the UN system and uh, human rights advocates are going to go from here uh, in the wake of uh, her controversial uh, visit? I think that it will be a great shame if uh, the High Commissioner doesn't ensure that her office issues the long promised uh, but yeah. long delayed report before she leaves office. Uh, there's no justification, I think, for leaving that to her successor. Uh, she should take the opportunity to put that report out. <clears throat> Those reports, incidentally, can be done in a whole variety of ways. Um, the report from the Office of the High Commissioner should say, uh, could say, uh, at one extreme, we believe all these allegations are totally founded and we condemn the government. The other extreme is to say, we haven't had access, we're not in a position to evaluate, but here is the gist of the series of allegations that have been made, and here are the responses by the Chinese government. And that would be very factual, as it were. Now, uh, as you'll guess, my sense is that one can do something in between those two extremes. But even the weak end of the spectrum, which summarizes, synthesizes, and puts out there uh, the many allegations that have been made based on the information that is available, would be an important step forward. Uh, and a failure to do that would really uh, threaten the credibility of the office itself. But I think the more interesting answer to your question actually uh, uh, is that the UN human rights system is happily more than the High Commissioner. Um, yes. It also consists of in particular what we call the special procedures or better known as the various special rapporteurs they have played an important role, um, not uh, primarily not through visits, uh, such as the one that I undertook because the Chinese government has been very reluctant, but they have been pretty consistent in reporting on specific problems, uh, engaging the Chinese government with formal complaints about the treatment of individuals and in particular situations. And I would hope that those uh, individuals will continue to play a significant role. Now, of course, the Chinese government could be expected to start to pressure them more. And it's interesting to note that China is now for the first time putting forward uh, quite a lot of candidates for the new positions that are opening up as special rapporteur. And obviously the intention there is to get 
uh, a number of uh, friendly uh, quote experts, uh, but also to be more present in the group discussions. Uh, so the special procedures are going to be under pressure, but that uh, yeah. doesn't stop them from uh, taking uh, strong action. I, I think you're absolutely uh, right on that. And I think you're especially right to, to highlight the role of some of the other uh, parts of the UN human rights system. Uh, sadly, we are uh, out of time. Uh, I uh, want to thank uh, our colleagues at the uh, National uh, Committee. I hope next time we can do stretch it to 45 minutes at least, uh, Margot, because we are just scratching the surface of a vitally important topic and uh, Professor Alston's uh, extremely insightful uh, comments on it. Uh, so with that, I want to uh, thank you, Professor uh, Alston, and, and thanks to you, uh, Margot, and, and, and all of the uh, friends and colleagues at the committee as well. Thank thanks, you Tom. very much to both of you. Um, Unfortunately, 45 minutes is too long for many in our audience, <laughs> but you have given us much to think about and we really appreciate your sharing your expertise and insights. We hope that I, those I, of you- I, I have a wonderful colleague here at the law school who is really very attuned to uh, these new forms of communication as I still think of them. And he's absolutely adamant. He would say that you're mad, Margot, that no one listens for more than 10 minutes to anything these days. Um, and unfortunately, I fear he's right. <laughs> unfortunately, I think he may be too. But for those who've lasted this long, we hope that those who've tuned in have found the interview interesting and informative and that you'll join us for future National Committee programs. Thanks again and goodbye.